I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting CapitalAllocators.com. My guest on today's show is Mark Johnson, the managing partner of Astra Capital Management, a mid-market growth buyout firm specializing in the communications and technology services sectors. Mark co-founded Astra after 20 years of experience investing at J.H. Whitney, Blackstone, and Carlisle. He partnered with seasoned deal and operating executives and brought the best practices from large shops to Astra with an entrepreneurial lens to address a focused strategy in a new way. Our conversation covers Mark's unusually planned life path, lessons from industry giants, and the formation of Astra with a utopian ideal in mind. We discuss the Astra team, thematic sourcing, financial creativity, deal dynamics, value creation within portfolio companies, factors of long-term success, co-investments, and club deals. Please enjoy my conversation with Mark Johnson in the second episode of Innovation in Private Markets. Mark, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Really excited to talk today. Well, why don't we go back and talk about how you first got started in investing? The investing part of my career really began as a matriculation and exploration into the finance world generally. I started in investment banking. And then while I was at Merrill Lynch, I worked on a deal called Park Communications. It was an odd communications broadcasting company that was owned by two entrepreneurs with 100% debt. And we were in the process of refinancing that debt package to the tune of making those two founders $200 million of profit with $0 invested. I I called it the um, Modigliani (laughs) and Miller company. And this idea of leverage and how it could be used to create value for ownership and for investors was powerfully brought to my attention in, in that experience. That was circa 1996 or so during my investment banking time. But you know, I was always attracted to Wall Street since my days in high school. I participated in a program called the Lead Program in Business down in Texas as a sophomore in high school. And I guess I found myself thinking I like math and I like history. So things that kind of deal with the social sciences always appeal to me. I chose Princeton partially because I read Liar's Poker my senior year in high school and Michael Lewis went to Princeton and it seemed to get him to Wall Street. So from a personal standpoint, a large part of my motivation growing up was to really make the most of what I felt were great opportunities that were provided to me in life that others around me maybe didn't have in the same abundance. And frankly, that in many cases, those who came before me had made available to me. My grandparents, my parents, I always say I was very much blessed with a wonderful, strong family, a great history in that family of hard work and dedication. And that lent itself to me having opportunities that I knew not a lot of other people had. A big piece of the puzzle that was missing was the financial piece and the power of creating wealth, of understanding finances, and of all that Wall Street had to offer and the position it existed in in the world was a place where I thought I could make the most of what had been made available to me. So even before investing, I'd say my interest in Wall Street began with this desire to prove myself worthy of the great luck I'd had in life. So what did you find when you got to Wall Street after those couple of years of yearning for it? What I found was hard work. I wouldn't say that the early days of my career were Wall Street opening its arms saying, you know, Mark Johnson, we've been waiting for you to come here. Here's, <laughs> here's, here's how, you, how you build a model. Here's how you start an LVO firm. It, in many cases, grit, determination. And, you know, while at Princeton, I did a few things. I met the love of my life, my wife, Kimberly, then Henderson, now Kimberly Johnson. And there's a conversation we had in college. And it's funny, I always say in four years, I was able to win two national championships and get an economics degree at Princeton, but I couldn't get a date with my wife until two years after college. So it took me six years to do that, but I could do other things. (laughs) But there was a day we sat and I said, I'm going to leave here. I'm going to go work at an investment bank for a couple of years. Maybe then I'll work at a private equity firm. 
I'd like to go to Harvard Business School probably. And there's this firm called Carlisle down in DC that I've heard of and I'd love to work there one day. And so my wife always in the early 2000s while I was at Carlisle would tell the story of how I basically planned the next 20 years of my life at 19. So the path I followed between 19 and 40, if you will, was pretty mapped out and I kind of followed it through grit and I met a lot of wonderful people who taught me the business, tons of smart people, tons of exciting opportunities to see deals, to meet some of the titans, if you will, of the industry, right? I, I was lucky to be part of that generation that was coming into firms like Blackstone and Carlisle while the founders were still active. And also I got to experience the amazing wave that was the early 2000s and 2010 to 2015 time period where firms like Blackstone and Carlisle that I was at went from medium sized, if you will, it felt large, but we didn't realize just how small it was until capital ballooned and deals ballooned. So it was an amazing ride, a great learning experience, but one that was hard fought just through diligence, continuing to, to put in the hours to learn the craft. So Mark, I want to pull a few threads out. You just blew by two national championships. <laughs> <laughs> what sport was that in in college? That was in lacrosse in college at Princeton. Although athletically, I think of swimming as the sport that I really focused on growing up. So growing up here in Washington, I spent most of my time in the swimming pool when I wasn't studying or at home. And that was probably the driving force in my life athletically. Lacrosse was something I did for fun in high school, but when I went to college, my swimming career ended. I swum too much butterfly, I think, and suffered a shoulder injury in my senior year in high school. And then uh, switched and walked onto the lacrosse team at Princeton. And we were lucky enough my freshman year and my junior year to win the national championships in 92 and 94. You had this path laid out, as you said. And a lot of times people with that kind of pedigree, you know, you go to Princeton, you go to Wall Street, you have these visions of being on a track. Somewhere along the way, sometimes people fall off that track for good reasons. And I'm curious, what was it about laying off that path that led you to stay on it? Sure. I would say responsibility. I felt very much throughout my career that others could have done all that I did as well or better than I did it. Whether it was the chance to go to a great high school, just the fact that you've got such a nurturing family at home and access to resources and inspiration and athletics. And for me, I felt a determination to invest in myself and invest in them as almost a thank you to those that came before me because I couldn't afford to rest on my laurels and that stuck with me throughout my career. That decade or more that you were working for the Carlisle's Black Rocks, the large private equity firm in the real heyday, which probably continues, what did you learn about the business that you wanted to replicate? At each of the firms I was lucky to work at. So at Whitney, the entire firm sat around one table every Monday morning. When a deal was done, you know, we sort of introduced the deal to the partnership. It was still the days when it felt like you were investing your own money. It felt like a true partnership. And the explosion of capital that we saw in private equity over the 20 years that would follow hadn't really occurred yet. It taught me one of the most basic lessons, which is in deal analysis and in running a firm, You've got to have that commitment that we're all in the same boat together concept. And what I loved about my time at Whitney is I, I never lost that, no matter if I was flying to Tokyo to work on a mega buyout or if I was restarting the equation at Astra on our first deal. But treat everything like you're curating something very special for yourself, others, and to treat your LP's capital as though it was not only your own, but something very precious. At Blackstone, I learned the intellectual honesty and rigor that goes into making good investment decisions. The one thing that was certainly taught over the time I spent there was that there are ways to easily make mistakes if you don't dedicate yourself to the craft of truly studying in depth what you do. And what I loved about Blackstone was the intellectual honesty of the investment process. There were no questions unasked, there were no holds barred, and making sure that we did our absolute best before and after we brought something to committee was really ingrained in me there. And it allowed me to kind of see what it really means to try your hardest and do your best. At Carlisle, I was able to sort of bring it all together, go both literally and figuratively coming home, 
to DC and to Carlisle was a great experience because there it wasn't just an experience that was relegated to working with people from the finance community. There were members of the business community that were part of the investing team at Carlisle. There were former political players that were part of the team. But at the same time, there was still that intense commitment to getting the investment right and driving to a great answer. And you had what I would call a nice guys finishing first. There were great people working very hard who were highly skilled in our industry. And it allowed you to sort of take into account all the elements of deal making, not just the financial analysis or the consulting frameworks that you would use, but what does a seasoned business leader like a Dan Ackerson think of a business that we're about to buy? What does a seasoned investor like a Bill Conway think? So I was just able to kind of bury myself in very experienced investment judgment, but also a broad scope of business experience that really seasoned it all. It was a wonderful time working with wonderful people. So when you've had a seat at the table at these great institutions for a long time, what was the impetus for leaving and going out on your own? A couple of things. One, just a sheer passion for the sector in which we invest. As I built my career, I'd always walked this line of having an expertise, but being able to be a generalist. You want to have access to the greatest deal flow so that you can learn the craft of investing, however it may come. I look at the time I spent working on a deal like TRW Automotive is that in the, in the auto sector. But at the same time, from the day I stepped into Merrill out of Princeton till now, I was always committed to the communications and technology sector. What I saw in the 2013, 2014 timeframe was an opportunity to move back to a lot of the investing that I had begun doing early in my career. Businesses that were 10 to $50 million of EBITDA, places where all of the technological change that's happening in the communications and technology sector was available to be invested in before the companies got too big. There's, there's very exciting things you can do with large checks to write at a mega fund. But I found myself missing a lot of the exciting businesses that we could support and work with that were a little bit smaller, that required more like 100 million of equity, not a billion of equity. And look, there's creativity all around in, in finance, but for me and in this sector, growth buyouts where you can work closely with entrepreneurs and managers in spaces that are growing fast and exciting in the industry, you know, that felt like what would be the pinnacle of my investing practice. That combined with two other dynamics. One, Personally, I always felt that this general belief that so much had been given to me through luck or happenstance that I should always try to do my absolute best. And if I have an opportunity to create a firm from whole cloth and push the industry towards something that's closer to its utopian ideal and knowing the place that firms like those in our industry sit, it's important for people who have a chance to be entrepreneurial to take that chance. And I knew that if I didn't take it, I would have regrets. And then third, the number one limiting reagent in starting a new private equity firm, it isn't capital, it isn't investment ideas, it's other skilled investors that are complementary to you, that are great people that you can work closely with. Having the opportunity to gather a set of partners like Bill Kennard, Kevin Beebe, Matt Murphy, and Todd Crick, who came from operating regulatory, technical side of the industry and bring us all together at a moment in time was another opportunity I just couldn't let pass me by. So you mentioned this idea of a utopian ideal and doing your own thing. So what is the utopia that you wanted to create? I often say to Nia or the team within Astra that the world didn't wake up needing another new private equity firm yesterday. There's thousands of them. I think you can sort of generally check the box of the asset class. But the beauty of the industry is a group of people putting their own fingerprint on investing and building relationships in the industry and creating investments that help accelerate the advancement of technology, help grow new companies that advance the mission that I think all of this technology exists for is something special when you can sort of build that type of energy. And then after you've created that, who you are and how you use that perch is really important. So the, the, the fact that a firm like Astra can exist where we do interact with our nonprofit partners like SEO or the Navy SEAL Foundation, and can also be participants in the growth of businesses like CTS, our in building wireless services company, or helping with our dark net business, Searchlight, which is 
really focused on child safety on the web. And there's lots of good that can be done, but at the end of the day, who we are and how we can take the governance and expertise that's applied in this industry, use it to make the world bend closer to justice, we try to do that. So when you decided to set out, what does the ecosystem for a new private equity fund look like? We know there's a lot of demand in the space, but often we see the big guys getting bigger and bigger. So how did you go about that whole process of getting going? It's difficult because despite spending a long time studying deal making, studying the industry, and what makes for a good investment, your interactions often aren't with the LP community on as broad a base as others when you're a deal maker. So you have to get to know a lot of people in the investment community. And it's it takes a while and it, it takes patience. And it really just takes an exercise of finding those that I would say are looking for you. The way I think about it and the advice I give others who are beginning that journey is you want to focus on the deal making, focus on the type of deals that you think you and your firm are suited to do. And that will attract the types of investors that are looking for those types of deals and people who add the value that you're looking to add. And, and that's really the thesis behind all that we do at, at Astra. It's building partnership. It's working alongside others who are committed to investing in the same way, and with the same culture that we have. And that's how we eventually found our friends at Wafra and Glendower, who worked with us before our first fund in the Logics Communications acquisition. That eventually led to the relationship with Constellation Capital, but also with many other investment groups that would ultimately be part of the first and the final close of our fund, and also part of the co-investment universe that supports the deals that we work on. So it's been a journey, but you just gotta keep putting one foot in front of the other one thing that helped on that journey, my partner, Matt Murphy, and I, in 2013, I guess we were, we were all approaching 40 and took a bit of time off and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro together. And the exercise of gathering a great group, which in this case was many of my closest friends, and spending a week looking at a peak that you can't reach and gradually walking towards that peak together while catching up and suffering through altitude sickness and all the things that come along. <laughs> It was perfect preparation for the first time fund fundraising process. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And most of all, know that the journey is the most important part of the exercise and who you're on that journey with is what matters the most. It's not the destination of getting capital. And even if a chunk of capital had been given to us immediately, who knows if that would have been the right choice? Because what I believe firmly is that we at Astra are in an exercise of identifying those who are great partners for us and what we do and how we do it. Because as we said, people looking to check a box on an investment allocation spreadsheet can do that easily in lots of different ways. And they can certainly do it without the risk of a first time fund combined with it. What we need are partnerships with our LPs and with our management teams that are strong and lasting and consistent with the type of investing we want to do, the type of firm we want to build, the type of value we want to create for, for all involved in what we're doing at Astra. And that's, that's really the joy of the process. How did you think about the value proposition specifically for Astra in a competitive landscape of however many hundreds or thousands of private equity firms? That was an easier thing to get my arms around. And it's really because of the luck I've had in the partners that joined Astra with me. So if I just spend a second with you walking through the backgrounds of, of the others. First, Bill Kennard and I really sort of hatched the idea of Astra after he had left Carlisle to become ambassador to the European Union. One of the seminal moments in my career was a day when a friend said, Bill Kennard wants to meet you. I was working at Blackstone <laughs> and Bill wanted to sit down and grab coffee and just talk to me about what they were doing in the communications practice at Carlisle in DC, where I had grown up and my wife was from also. And it was, it was a very natural choice. And as you know, I still had that 20 year plan in the back of my head that, you know, I thought Carlisle was probably in the cards for me at some point anyways. And it led to a, a great friendship as well as a wonderful experience. But the idea of working together on something entrepreneurial after he returned from Brussels was something we had discussed. Off and on since our time at Merrill Lynch, my partner Matt Murphy and I had discussed this. And Matt, during the 15, 20 years that had ensued since we were analysts together, had spent time at firms like MC Partners and Great Hill Partners. He had also then pivoted his career into the operations world, where he was backed by Abri 
to work at businesses like Atlantic Broadband and Grande Communications and had lived the life of many of the entrepreneurs that we were going to be investing with. My other two co-founders, Kevin Beebe and Todd Crick, also came from really esteemed backgrounds in the industry. Kevin had been the president of Altel Communications, advisor to Goldman and TPG, had worked with me at Carlisle after the sale to Verizon, and was just an incredibly knowledgeable operator and very well connected in the industry. Todd Crick and I have been friends since the early 2000s, where his consulting firm, Encode, had been a secret weapon, if you will, of the communications and tech team at Carlisle. And they were really, when I first got to know them, known as more of a service provider on technical and strategic decisions to carriers, not to private equity shops. And Todd and I worked closely together for many years. He eventually sold his firm to Ericsson. And for me, bringing together the power of what Kevin, Bill, Matt, and Todd could understand about the industry, could identify within the industry. And if I could sprinkle in some investment judgment and for the most part, stay out of the way of the genius that the other four founders created, you know, I felt like we'd have something that made a lot of sense. Over time, and we're still living this, have had to corral that into an investment process and into specifics. This concept of constant self-improvement, whether it's at the portfolio, within the firm, kind of definition and redefinition of how we do what we do is really key. We, we haven't talked about it yet, but we call our firm Astra Capital because of this phrase, per aspera at Astra, which means with work to the stars. It harkens back, really, in my mind, to a swimming concept that affected me growing up and upon reflection on my whole life, I think, has been sort of the driving force, which is while you want to always have goals and you want to work hard towards those goals, you want to make sure that you recalibrate, reset those goals and are constantly pushing yourself to achieve the most that you can. And we believe that that's true within our firm and we think that's true with the companies that we work with. And that defining ethos is something that I found really useful as we've grown the firm, as we've built out our processes. And I think it makes for a wonderful value proposition for those who are looking for a growth buyout product, something that really focuses on transforming businesses that have opportunity to excel in our industry into businesses that are leaders in our industry. We use the buyout product, if you will, to create value in that context. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is identify opportunity and help businesses transform in ways that allows them to take advantage of that and to grow with the wind at their back in the industry. And it's often difficult to do that with very large businesses. You may find that you've already soaked up a lot of that growth, but the companies that we identify, the managers that we work with, we can spend a lot of time doing what's really I, I would argue the most fun, which is finding your niche and excelling in it, pushing yourself a little bit beyond your ability, or as I would put it in swimming terms, taking another second off of your time, which you never hear of someone saying, you know, I swam the perfect race. You could always go a second faster. And that concept has stuck with me throughout my career. And if there's anything that drives Astra, it's, it's that passion for continual improvement and reassessment. I'd love to walk through your investment process with this eye towards these aspects that you've continuously improved compared to what you saw in your past. So why don't we just start with, at the top of the funnel, the sourcing of these ideas? We have generally a three-pillar segmentation of the communications and technology sector. So it's either mobility, fixed line, or technology services. But Within those three pillars that we focus on, at any given time, we have eight to 10 subsectors in all of those pillars. So often led by Todd, given, of course, his consulting background, the associate teams with input from the partners are constantly assessing and reassessing, you know, call it on average, 10 different subsectors within each of those pillars that we find generally attractive. From those subsectors, we'll then build investment themes. Those investment themes are then given a deep dive and iterated on by a given team within the firm that shares those on a regular basis with the broader partnership. And then as a partner gets excited about one of those sub-themes, we begin to pursue active engagement with businesses, attendance of conferences. And it gives us sort of a list of here are the five or six different things that we like. But the real foundation, the superstructure that allows that to exist within the firm effectively is our quarterly partners meetings. So from 
I guess it's been now six years that we've been doing it. We all come together one day a quarter to just reflect on where the industry's headed, what our 10 times three, 30 subsectors are that we're focused on, and what the handful of high priority investment areas are below that. From there, if we don't have kind of a purposeful process that says, here are the things that we like, and here are the places within our networks that we should be thinking about building relationships and identifying opportunities, we'll never know that one of us has coffee every day with the perfect entrepreneur to help us support a given subsector. What we will also do is build a a cadre of industry advisors who support us in those other efforts as well. So certain subsectors become generally attractive for long periods of time. Cybersecurity, for example, was one of the first that we became excited about. Rich Wilhelm who's our advisor in that segment, ran the Booz Allen cybersecurity practice for many years. And, you know, we find people like Rich who can help us have that edge that gives us kind of an insider's knowledge of a given segment. And throughout our networks and throughout our walks of life, we sort of make sure that we keep an eye out for people like that. Once all of that is done, and we're finding businesses, not because they're being delivered to us, but because they live in an area where we think there's excitement. That's when more of the financing and financial engineering expertise is brought to bear. We may see a business that is a take private. We may see a business that is a straight LBO acquisition. We may say it's 2018 or 2019. We're in the ninth year of a bull market And buying lots of EBITDA with lots of debt for very high prices is not the way we want to do buyouts right now. Let's find businesses that we can buy that are relatively small, backed by great teams, have the opportunity for us to infuse equity capital over time in creative ways and to layer in debt as those businesses grow. So a lot of the deals that we did in 2020 which we really began looking for in 2019, were an outgrowth of that strategy, which you know, I think about our business CTS, Communications Technology Services. We had a very deliberate, probably 12 month process of identifying what we liked in the in-building wireless sector, which is, you think about manufacturing 4.0, whether it's automation with robots or assessment of the shop floor, safety precautions, security precautions, There's only more technology being pumped into the four walls of given enterprises. And the wireless networks that live in those enterprises are becoming unwieldy for companies to manage. Maybe the largest Fortune 30 businesses can create an internal, effectively wireless carrier to service their factories. But we think that one of the major growth areas going forward in mobility is the in-building world. Support that infrastructure. The rise of 5G technology actually is best suited for in building environments where low latency is required and the capacity to monitor a propeller as it's built or monitor a robot as it's picking and packing on a factory or, or shop floor is something that we identified really in, I'd say, probably late 2018, early 2019. And through the course of the year, We follow the exact process I described to scour the industry for opportunities. And when we landed on CTS, we and they were finishing one another's sentences about the opportunity that existed to pivot their business into this as a service model, as we would call it. They had been uh, among the leading providers of design, infrastructure construction, and support of great venues that had in building wireless networks already. So they're they're a go-to service provider for the large carriers. They've worked with huge enterprises like Kaiser and also worked with the tower companies to install networks, but they wanted to become an an owner of networks themselves. And it was an ideal opportunity for us to partner with their existing ownership that had been a family business for 30 years, refinance their balance sheet, but also facilitate growth through the creation of a new segment and, and a small acquisition that would allow them to move into the managed services area as well. We've done something similar in the data center world, and we're also doing that in cybersecurity. So it's great when you can find a way to use your financial creativity to identify businesses, to help businesses that you've already identified move into the spaces they want to move into. And that's, that's what we try to do. But it begins with a deep understanding of the segment and strong relationships in the industry. So if you start that filter, you've got your three core sectors and then the 30 subsectors and you get your themes, it sounds like what you're trying to do, if I understand it right, is find tailwinds in each of these sectors. 
What happens when you get to that theme or that tailwind level with the pricing and competitive dynamics when there are so many other people out there looking for good deals as well? You've usually identified the tailwind in the creation of the subsectors, right? Inbuilding would have been one of those six or seven subsets of, call it the wireless pillar. We know that that growth is coming. Then the question is, like you say, should we just buy the hottest thing in that segment? That's where relationship and industry expertise really matters. That's where you really need to lean on your ability to attract talented managers to the investment theme. So the fact that when we approached the folks at CTS, we had already thought through the different subsectors that they would want to pursue. That my partner, uh, Ty Crick, had known the management team there from a decade ago and actually had helped them win some business in their early days. And the fact that we've got people like Bill and Kevin and Matt who are experienced in the industry adds credibility. We were by no means the first private equity shop that approached them, but at the same time, we are able to then leverage our credentials in the industry. I always say we, we like to find situations where we can win based on our experience, our relationships, and our expertise, not our ability to pay a dollar more than someone else. And you can avoid auctions, although even in auction situations, that can matter. Businesses do not always go to the company that only pays the highest price, particularly when they're relatively small and if the seller is working with you to grow the business after the acquisition. You just have to creatively find situations where your expertise matters. It reminds me of some of the conversations you've had in other podcasts that I listen to. You know, My good friend Andy Golden at Prinko talks about the same thing. Where can we sustainably apply our competitive advantage and win? That's what we built in the creation of the firm, and that's what we use when we identify deals. How do you guys go about making that decision? You know, you're doing this work, you're finding the themes. You could easily see a situation where everybody just wants to do the deal that you've identified. So how does that process work internally? We have an investment committee that includes the founders plus two other MDs that are seasoned professionals at the firm. And process matters. And, and from the day we founded the firm, we instituted that. Despite the fact that even before we raised the fund, we were struggling to identify deals and you sort of want to just do the deal that can get done. But that's not the way to build a track record. That's not the way to build long-term value. And so the discipline of passing on deals that don't make sense is something that's been there since day one. It may come from the fact that we have seen so many deals collectively within our own past. And while my partners have pretty impressive experience in having worked with businesses that succeeded, we've all learned from the businesses that have struggled. So the pain of doing a bad deal is something you don't quickly forget. And I think good investors never forget. You've got to get it right. And having a commitment to process and understanding that point of indifference and what side of it you need to be on is important for the whole institution to understand. We spend a lot of time on that. It's a joint intellectual exercise that everyone needs to go through. I, I, again, I think back to my time at Blackstone where we really learned that. There's no such thing as a perfect deal and there's no such thing as a no-brainer situation. You really got to make sure that you're making the right decision. I often say to my guys, you have to know that we know what we know. What's the playbook after you've bought a company? We spent a lot of time on that. We recently brought on a head of portfolio management who had come from a, a bit of the consulting world. And he and I, over the last six, nine months, have literally written what we were calling a playbook to kind of how we build value and how we create value. There's multiple lenses to it. You know, if you think about our deals and how they work from a temporal standpoint, there's the foundational phase, the transformational phase, and then what we call the independence phase. And I have a tendency, and it doesn't lend itself to the podcast medium, to A, use a lot of whiteboards, and B, to often draw what we call with an asterisk, the swoosh, this logarithmic curve that talks about process improvement that constantly happening within our portfolio companies. And the first chunk of the swoosh is that foundational phase, putting in place governance, putting in place really first and foremost culture. So getting the right blocking and tackling elements of the deal in place and call it the first six months to a year of the investment. Then you usually have some form of seminal events. It could be incremental m and It could be transformation of the management team. It could be just the launch of a new product. But whatever it is that we bought the business to go and try to do, we then begin to do after the foundation is set and during that transformational phase. Helping the business execute on that, 
is the lion's share of our, our whole period and really where I think we're doing the best of what we do, although I don't know that you can really dissect which segment is more important than the other. But eventually, the business gets to a place where it needs to stand on its own two feet without us and be truly independent. I always say, we plan to exit these investments for ourselves and our investors. And if we don't foster independence, then we'll own them forever. And we work very purposefully along those lines too. That could mean refinancing ourselves out with other partners. It could mean exiting to a strategic player or another capital provider. But most importantly, it's about pushing the team to analyze itself, to lead without our support and to not, not, not be carried by Astra at that phase. And so it's an exciting process. We have a, alongside that, what we call the pyramid of value creation. You know, it begins with this foundation that is the culture of the firm. So again, prosper at Astra. Within, we ask of ourselves exactly what we ask of our businesses and our management teams, which is we need a culture of success, culture of commitment to the mission of the company, obviously a culture of support for the community and integrity, and then from there, you walk through governance, you walk through transparency, you walk through analytics, and it ultimately crests with value creation because you need to gradually build that foundation from the bottom up. And when we assess our businesses in our quarterly meetings on a regular basis, we sort of look at them along those lines and say, well, what piece of the puzzle might be missing? How is our governance? How is our culture? What's our transparency? Where's our growth? Are we creating value? And all of that is something that, again, we've had to really write down and make purposeful. We have a handful of our little epithets that are developing around, you know, the rules of thumb within the business, you know, statements like fix finance first and making sure that we are creating real transparency and real connectivity between the investment thesis, the recording of the business and the theory behind what we're looking to do. Creation of economic value on a unit economic basis is, is really important. So assessing customer lifetime value and driving to pure value creation and I wouldn't say an academic sense, but in a truly theoretical and actual sense. So our businesses don't go unanalyzed and they get a lot of attention. And frankly, we don't have a huge stack of portfolio companies to manage, making sure we've got the time to spend with the businesses we own. We spent a lot of time after the first closing of our fund pursuing our first few deals because of this also. We wanted to allow our processes to mature. We wanted to grow our team and we wanted to buy businesses that we knew we could apply those processes to. It's been a great journey and we now have, you know, I would say our, our business logics, Fiber Networks is inching into the independence phase with our cybersecurity and building wireless and data center assets We've sort of moved from the foundation to the transformational phase. It's really exciting and it allows us to be really purposeful about where the company is and what they are looking to do over the near term and how that fits into the long-term goals. So as you've moved from a startup to now you're seven, eight years in and you look around the corner and say, well, you want to be doing this for 10 or 20 more years as this kind of next generation of private equity firm. Where do you think you'll need to innovate going forward? to stay competitive and stay ahead of the rest of the pack? When we first started chasing deals and we hadn't raised our fund yet, I never referred to us as a fundless sponsor. I referred to us as a sponsor that had not yet raised the fund. And now that we have raised the fund and we've done a handful of deals, I really do think of the mission somewhat similarly in the sense that we bring a lot of co-invest into our deals today because what we're really trying to do is perfect the art of doing the types of deals that we do. And regardless of the size of our fund at a given time, what we want to do are a handful every year of great deals that sort of fit that hundred-ish million dollar equity check size. Right? So think of us as investing what would feel like a billion dollar equity fund if we did it 100% all equity out of our fund at any given time and not looking to grow aggressively, but looking to perform exceptionally. And the key to that will be the battle scars, the team we build, the entrepreneurs that come into our fold. You know, I, I worked at firms where there was a pantheon of great managers who had performed in, in amazing deals for Carlisle, for Blackstone, and, and geez, for Whitney, you know, going back for decades, of course, because the firm had been around for so long. And I'm excited to build that bench of great entrepreneurs and managers that we work with over time. And so I think our ability to continue to 
perfect the art, if you will, of finding and doing the deals we do and to build a broad community of interest around that. That importantly includes managers, of course, includes great investment partners, financing partners, and others. That's what's going to lead to the success. It's at the end of the day, the people that we bring into the fold internally and the relationships that we cultivate externally, and how well we do that over time, that's going to allow us to have staying power. That's, to me, what made all the great firms I've had a chance to be around great for a very long period of time. How have the dynamics of co-investing changed over time from your perspective in the GP seat? It's changed over the course of my career, really interestingly. When I was at larger firms that already had not funds that are nearly as large as they are now, but still more than enough capital to do the deals that we wanted to do, Co-investment was something that we offered to LPs as an aside. It was usually a replacement for capital that could have gone into the fund, but didn't. And it was kind of a nice to have for LPs. I think now the market's matured to a point where it can be an active part of a fund strategy. And it is an active part of our strategy at Astra. So you think about the partners we have from Constellation, large, global pension funds, as well as sovereign wealth institutions that could put to work much larger checks than we could ever write, but are working with us because they think we'll find unique opportunities where, sure, our fund will be the first priority in sourcing and investing, but where they can ride along and top up our capital. So our fund can be a portion of the deal and our LP's capital can be a portion of the deal. And that's where I think true alignment between GP and LP really exists if you do it correctly. It's also where We can begin to build relationships with future LPs for future funds and frankly, work alongside institutions that may only co-invest alongside us. So to me, it's true partnership in deal making. It's a wonderful tool and it's been a great way for us to work closely with the friends that we already have, to build relationships with new friends, and most important, to fund great businesses and do interesting deals. And how have you thought about that lens from the perspective of competitors, cooperators, other private equity firms doing deals together in terms of equity checks? I lived through the days of club deals as firms grew. And you know, I've had lots of war stories working on the mega deals. Like you know, I remember Bill and I worked on the Univision transaction when it was Clash of the Titans, right? You had someone from every big firm or the Alltel deal I, I talked about when Kevin sold that company, we were, we were partnered with KKR. So the idea of, of working alongside other investment firms is something that's by no means foreign to me. And I think it could make a lot of sense. And when you find like-minded individuals that can benefit from pursuing a deal with you, it's great. It's another arrow in our quiver. We We love working with our LPs and our our investors, but at the same time, if marrying talents with another firm that may say have experience in turnarounds or some other kind of segment, maybe even an infrastructure fund that has a different cost of capital than we have, where it makes sense to collaborate and you've got trust and relationship, it's a wonderful thing. Um, We've also got a, a lot of institutions that invest up and down the balance sheet. So We're doing a deal right now with another fund that's not much bigger than we are on the equity side, but they happen to also have a credit product or preferred equity product. And working with the people that that speak your language and and invest in a way that you invest is just a great way to create value when you can. Where have you seen some of those club deals go wrong? I have to be careful with some of the war stories I share, but when there's too much true sort of co-opetition going on. In the heyday, call it the 2010 time frame, when the Titans were clashing on mega deals, it could sometimes get a little sharp elbowed. Everyone's looking to win the deal. You don't quite understand everyone's intentions. And it, it seems that we're all moving in the same direction, kind of collectively performing due diligence. But then, you know, you realize there's a, there's a cabal that's formed. It's, I mean, it's fun. I enjoy the intrigue and it's kind of made for TV, I guess. But at the end of the day, it began on occasion to sort of get in the way of the real job that we have to do of just truly good investing. And I think that's why as those firms began to grow, you saw a little bit less and less of it because there was more competition going on than there was real value creation because everyone could do the deal pretty much themselves. What's been your biggest challenge thus far in growing out Astra? 
you know, it really evolves. Today, the challenge is managing the portfolio. In the beginning, of course, there were challenges attracting capital. Every challenge kind of evolves with the stage of the business. The challenges, they change every day, which deal to do, which deal not to do, how to do it, how to create our processes and commit to those processes and get everyone coalesced around one idea. It sometimes seems when you start a business that is a private equity firm and your product is deal making, the impetus is to say, well, let's go do some deals because that's the product we need to go produce. But the inherent tension that everyone needs to understand and really wallow in, if you will, is we got to do the right deals. We got to have what one of my partners calls our North Star, which is not just doing deals and not just doing deals because we're, we are paid to find and do deals, but doing great deals and making sure that the deal we do is an Astra quality deal. And that's something that everyone's committed to, but it's something that you've got to build organically through the hard work of having our, our weekly calls, going through our IC process. Uh, passing on deals that looked like they were going to happen and didn't, reviewing the 100 deals we looked at the prior year. So a lot of it's just the hard work of trudging through all of that activity, but it's been wonderful. Well, Mark, I want to turn to a couple of closing questions before I let you go. So what's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I would consider myself not a triathlete, but a guy who tries to do as many triathlons as he can do. Over the last decade or so, I've probably done a dozen or so. And I don't know if it's the old days of swimming, the ability to transition between sports, but that activity is, is what I do to sort of keep myself in shape. And it, it gives me something to strive for. What's your most important daily habit? Buying coffee for my wife every morning. One of the wonderful advantages of the lockdown is with no business travel for the last 12 months, I have the ability to wake up every morning, go to Starbucks and get her a cappuccino, which is something I really enjoy. What's your biggest pet peeve? Inactivity. <laughs> I have trouble staying still. And sometimes you do just have to wait for things to develop, but I'm prone to action. What's your favorite book? Jonathan Livingston Seagull, by Richard Bach. It speaks to all the things we've talked about today, right? This, this idea of knowing that ideal speed is not a number that you achieve, he says in that book. It's being there in that moment when you're learning that you're learning and you're going from 80 miles an hour to 90 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour and eventually even faster than that. And you quickly realize it doesn't matter what you're trying to achieve. It matters that you're trying to improve. And that book is this amazing study of that concept, learning how to get better at getting better. And it's really inspirational and, and very well written about a, a little bird that breaks from the pack and wants to fly high and fly fast, despite the fact that he's a seagull. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? The statements from my mom and dad that ring in my head most often is my dad said to me often, if you aim for nothing, you'll definitely hit it. My mom will often say, Mark, make deliberate moves. I guess it's her version of the same thing, which is you need to plan, you need to pursue. And you don't really have the luxury in this world of just hoping good things happen. You got to try your best to make the best of what you got. And I think that's served me well. And it gives me a real drive. Okay, Mark, I got one more for you before I ask you about mistakes for our premium members. So what life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I've learned in the last decade that it is about the journey and not about the destination. I think I spent probably the first 40 years of my life, or at least the middle 30 from, you know, call it 10 to 40, in aggressive pursuit of specific goals. And while I think that determination served me well, and I, I'm appreciative of it, Astro was my first sort of step into the unknown. And in many ways, the Kilimanjaro Ultra was a metaphor for this. There's a spot in that climb called the Shira Plateau, where you first get a look, you get high enough that you can see the summit of the mountain. And it looks like you've got to walk 100 miles out and you've got to go 100 miles up to get there. And it seems like you're never going to get there. And I keep that image on my phone because we did get there. And you realize that life is about just making that journey, seeing that thing off in the distance that appears you, you're never going to reach and pursuing the goal of reaching it. And most importantly, who you go on that journey with and what you do along the way is what truly matters because 
honestly, the least enjoyable part of climbing a mountain is being at the summit. Well, Mark, with that, thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 